Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Alex Chernoff. I'm the Chancellor of the University, and on his behalf, I extend to you a very warm welcome to this uh, second uh, annual NAM oration, an event which is central to the university's engagement strategy with the Indigenous community. It is also a primary annual event in the calendar of the Mrap Barrick Institute of Indigenous Development. The name of this oration reflects the recognition of the country on which this event is taking place. Nam is the Wawaring word for the area around Port Phillip Bay. And the Nam oration is companion to the Dungala Kayala oration, which we hold each year, and I might say very successfully, in Shepparton. Uh, this evening we were to receive welcome to country from Auntie Joy Wandon Murphy, but unfortunately she's unwell and cannot be with us. But we're fortunate that Auntie Diana Kerr is here to provide the welcome to country on this important occasion. Auntie Diane is an elder of the Wurundjeri uh, tribe. She's a proud mother, grandmother, auntie, foster parent to many, many uh, young people. Her community work is guarded by the philosophy of holistic approach. Her impressive employment history has spanned work in early childhood education, the stolen generations, and cultural heritage management. I now invite Auntie Diane Kerr to conduct a welcome to country. Oh, good evening, everybody. I'd like to pay my respects to my elders, my elders past and present, elders present here today, and elders of different nations that are here today. I'd like to pay my respects to the Chancellor. I'd like to pay my respects to Dr Begay and all of the special guests that are here today. I'm both proud and honoured to stand here today on behalf of Joy to welcome you to the country of my grandmother, mother, ancestors, and Wurundjeri family. And this is uh, very special to me. And I'm very proud to be associated with the Melbourne University. I come here quite often, and I like that they strive for reconciliation with the Indigenous communities. And I'm extra proud that I'm here to see Indigenous students that are going to, uh, what's the word, graduate. And um, I often think about it because sometimes you think that you're graduating and that's it, but it's not. Graduation to me means that you've excel excelled on your pathway through life. It means that you have done extremely well in life, that you can now support and help the Indigenous community. Each and every student is a mentor to their family and everybody should be proud and honoured to be associated with them. Before I say my final welcome, I would like to ask Dr Begay to come forward. I have a gift from the Wurundjeri people. Um, we're very proud to be associated with him, to have met him, and we wanted to pay respect to him and his community and to your family, and I wish to be able to pass on a message stick to you. I would just like in closing to say that I'd like each and every one of you to start to know your people next door, people in your community of different cultures, get to understand them, hear their culture and share their cultures. Respect each other, love each other, because if we can do that, we can live in harmony. I'd like to offer you my hand in friendship, in friendship and as a symbol of reconciliation so that we can walk together in peace and harmony. May Bunjil, my creator, surround you and keep you safe on country. On behalf of my elders and Aunty Joy, I say we Minjika, welcome. I wish to welcome you from the tops of the trees to the roots in the ground. And if you look after the country, it will look after you. Thank you.
Many thanks, Auntie Diane, for your welcome. And I too would like to honour the elders, past and present. In particular, I acknowledge the elders of the Victorian Koori community who are present here tonight. And a special welcome to Duwawa Marika, an elder from the y y Yalambara community from East Arnhem Land and Aboriginal artist in residence at Trinity College. In order for you to follow the proceeding uh, more easily this evening, can I give an outline of the events which are to come, which are also set out on the third page of your brochure? First, I will award a professional certificate to indig in Indigenous research and training practice to eight of the first cohort of students to have completed the course. The students will be presented by Professor Marcia Langton, the Foundation Chair uh, of Australian Indigenous Studies at this university. We will then welcome the 2010 NAM Orator, Dr Manley Begay, Director of the Native Nations Institute for Leadership, Management and Policy at the University of Arizona. At the conclusion of the oration, Deputy Vice-Chancellor for University Affairs, Professor Warren Bebbington, will move the vote of thanks and will tell us about the new partnership between Marab Marab Barrick Melbourne Institute for Indigenous Development and Rio Tinto Australia. The new partnership will then be launched by the Managing Director of Rio Tinto Australia, Mr David Peaver. This will be followed by short closing remarks by Professor Ian Anderson, the Director of the Marab Barrick Institute, and I will then conclude the proceeding and ask you to stand while those in the procession will leave the auditorium. In just a few moments, as I've indicated, I shall present certificates to the eight students who have successfully completed their graduate studies for the professional certificate to which I've referred. But before I do that, I would like to tell you something about the program in which these students were engaged. Uh, that program brings together Indigenous graduate students from all over Australia with their academic supervisors for a five-day residential intensive uh, to develop the skills, knowledge and commitments needed to go on and complete the journey through research hard degrees such as the PhD. The program has operated at this university in January of each year since 2002 and to date approximately 130 students have completed it. In 2010 the program was offered for the first time as a professional certificate and this evening we're awarding the certificate to eight of the 14 students who successfully completed the course requirements. Given the tyranny of distance, uh, students uh, who travel to the course, are, not all of them can come this evening. So only eight of these 14 are able to be here this evening and they will receive their certificate in the way I've described. Now, the design and the delivery of the program has been achieved by collaborative, collaborative effort, and that's important to recognise. The original conception of the Indigenous postgraduate summer school grew from the intellectual leadership of Professor Marsha Langton in consultation with like-minded colleagues from universities across Australia. A number of partners within the university have contributed to the work required to transform the summer school into an award-based program. In particular, the Melbourne School of Graduate Research, the Centre for of Higher Education and the Faculty of Medicine, Dentistry and Health Sciences. And I'm delighted to see that their Dean, Professor James Angus, is with us tonight. The delivery of this pilot program in 2010 would not have occurred without the academic support of Christine Asma and Dr. Jane Fremantle. The program is supported each year by the Centre for Indigenous Education and the students stay at Trinity College. The future of the program is assured thanks to very generous gifts to the university which has enabled the development of an Indigenous Graduate Study Pathway Fund. This gift will fund a residential intensive development program for Indigenous research and will also be used to fund travel, accommodation and course delivery costs. Thanks to the gift, we will be able to develop this academic program into a graduate certificate that will enable enrol students to consolidate their skills in relation to research leadership and management. And can I take the opportunity on behalf of the university to congratulate the eight students about to receive their awards. You've worked hard during an intensive period of study and are entitled to feel proud of your achievements. 
I also want to extend the university's thanks to your academic supervisors and course leaders and to others who have supported you in your endeavour, many of whom can't be present here this evening for obvious reasons. Your achievements, of course, belong to you, but it's appropriate to recognise that the help that was provided by so many others. Now, at the conclusion of the presentation of the awards, there will be a short session during which students will be photographed, much as one's used to see at a wedding reception. Um, I, I now call on Professor, Professor Marsha Langton, Foundation Professor of Indigenous Studies, to come to the lectern to present the recipients of the certificate to which I've referred. Thank you, Auntie Diane, for the welcome to country. And uh, my respects to all your elders, past and present. <laughs> Chancellor, it gives me great pleasure to present to you these candidates who have been awarded the Professional Certificate in Indigenous Research and Training Practice, Victoria Close. <laughs> Anne-Marie Hammond. Terry James. <laughs> Kerry Mudge. <laughs> Leanne Pilkington. <laughs> Christopher Wilson. Scott Winch. Now, thank you very much, Professor Langton, for presenting these t students tonight and for all the work you've put into the uh, program over the past seven years. And once again, I offer my congratulations to the students who have collected their awards and wish you all the best for the future. This concludes the presentation of the awards and it's time now to move to the main item of our agenda, uh, the NAM oration. And it's my very great pleasure to introduce tonight's orator, Dr. Manley Begay. Dr. Begay joins us from the University of Arizona where he is faculty chair of the Nat Native Nation Nations Institute for Leadership, Management and Policy and senior lecturer and associate social scientist in the American Indian Studies program. He's also a faculty affiliate at the Institute of Environment and Society and co-director of the Harvard Project on American Indian Economic Development in the John F. Kennedy School of government. Dr. Begay teaches on Indigenous nation building, curriculum development and Indigenous education and prior to 2000 he taught at Harvard University for seven years. His research and work experience have focused on projects about Indigenous nations in the promotion of strong and effective institutions of governance and leadership. Dr. Begay has presented on a range of topics from leadership to Indigenous nation building curriculum development of pedagogy, and from the uh, historical contemporary indigenous issues to education at national and international colleges and universities, private and public high schools, national and international conferences, institutes and symposiums. He works closely with indigenous nations in the US, the First Nations in Canada, Aboriginal communities in, America, in Australia, and Maoris in New Zealand. In addition to his teaching role, 
as if he had time to do anything else, at the University of Arizona, and he's worked with the Native, Insti Na Native Nations Institute at the Harvard Project. Dr. Begay serves on several boards, including the Board of Trustees of the National Museum of the American Indian, the Advisory Board for the Banff Centre Leadership Development at the Banff Centre in Alberta in Canada, and on the Board of Directors of the Policy Consensus Initiative at Portland State University in Oregon. He was originally asked to serve as a policy advisor uh, to the Din Hata Ali, formerly the Dino Medicine Men's Association of the Navajo Nation. He is uh, a member of the Navajo Nation, and I'm told that he's the first Navajo citizen to have completed a PhD at Harvard University. Our university is particularly honoured to have you here, Dr. Begay, uh, this evening to present our second NAM oration, an oration where Indigenous thinkers from across the world help us to enrich our thinking about possible futures of our Indigenous population. So, Dr. Begay, I welcome you to the lectern to give the 2010 NAM oration. Yate Quasene, Skados Ned and Ostenigido, Kay Redeshinson. Equitinath, the straw needy, Hatiz is a straw needy as a year by Henson. Ado quer, change treasure than Linigi, quer the Baranigi, Orangi than Lidigi, Edigi, a Spahazendo let us know, Kay Redeshnil. Quen Geno, Nikayahe, Nia. Quite on Jono, he kayaki quite a shadow left the quishing cow, Hawan, the sir. Oh, he had the edition in his auditioner. I don't think Edo, yet Ned and Lenny don't have chin than Lenny, I see you about Hansen. What our Ecoto, he had the edition. My dish gives you an inchler. Tachini was a chin. Look at Ned as a chido to reach it as another. I do, Pilkin Schneid, or at Nendler. I don't the shall chinel to hear your destiny, or long so. Go, what are you at? Each at his citizen. Now that you're all confused, <laughs> I just uh, wanted to uh, say thank you for the invitation uh, to be here. I appreciate uh, having been here the last several days. <clears throat> I have a deep abiding respect for the traditional owners of uh, this territory. And thank you for the beautiful gift uh, that, was, that was given. I'm uh, uh, respectful of um, your land, uh, your waters, your plants, your animals, uh, your air, uh, all the way up into the heavens, the stars. And I, um, I come from the Navajo Nation. Uh, my wife is also from the Navajo Nation. I gave you my clans. I'm a Coyote Pass clan. Also, uh, the red running into the water people. Uh, as Navajo people, we always introduce ourselves with four clans. Our, our mother's clan, our father's clan, our mother's father's clan, and our father's father's clan as well. And I gave you those clans for those of you that uh, understand Navajo. And uh, it gives me great honor and, and pleasure to um, to be here to give this uh, oration. I come from uh, the Navajo Nation, <clears throat> and we number uh, 300,000 people. And uh, our, we're the largest uh, Aboriginal group uh, in North America by population and also by land mass. Uh, our land is uh, uh, approximately 27,000 miles of land, square miles of land. and. Uh, as I speak, we're buying back our land, our territory. And uh, at the turn of the century, we numbered 7,000. Now we number 300,000. So you can see the tremendous amount of change that has occurred uh, 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 even with my own people. You can drive on my land for four or five hours and you will not run into one 
non-Indigenous community. If you drove east, west, if you drove south, north, the same thing. You would not run into a non-Indigenous community. So our land is uh, contiguous. And if you are driving too fast, you would be stopped by the Navajo police. <laughs> you would be given a ticket by the Navajo police, and you would have to pay a fine in Navajo court. If you contested that fine, you would probably end up at the Navajo Nation Supreme Court, where you will be uh, tried based on Navajo fundamental laws, which is customary law, traditional law, natural law. That is our law. And today, the Navajo Nation Supreme Court renders decisions using Navajo fundamental laws on everything from insurance cases to land cases to election cases, just about every manner of, of legal issue that arises before the Navajo Nation. So the Navajo Nation Supreme Court uh, enjoys that. <clears throat> and it's a, it's a highly respected court system. It's recognized by state governments, the federal government, and it's recognized by uh, the foremost law schools uh, throughout the United States. So you can see I come from a very uh, proud nation. And uh, the story tonight that I'm gonna tell you is about this political renaissance. Slide, please. We're in this era, an era of nation building that has never happened before in the history of the United States. Probably the only time that we have enjoyed nation building was before the settlers arrived uh, in our territory. And this is around uh, the late 1400s. And since then, we've had to deal with the Spanish, we've had to deal with the Mexicans, we had to deal with uh, a variety of other uh, settlers to our country. And today, we're in the midst of this nation building. We've moved from self-determination to nation building. And it's producing some amazing results. Today, since, uh, 1900, uh, since the 1990s, um, uh, per capita income has increased three times larger than the United States income. It's unbelievable. And it has had a tremendous amount of impact on social conditions, educational attainment rates, uh, tradition and culture as well. And this has occurred without gaming. So what I'm talking about is uh, without gambling casinos. Some of you are probably thinking, well, oh, it must be gambling, but it's not. It helps, but it's not, that's not where the answer lies, we think. Next slide, please. So let me just tell you some stories. Here's Mississippi Choctaw, next. This is an unbelievable place. Um, the unemployment rate at Mississippi Choctaw is zero, even in the midst of economic recession. Every Choctaw that wants a job has a job, and they've done it through manufacturing, and, and they've done it through some tremendous amount of leadership uh, as well. Coach de Pueblo in New Mexico, one of the most conservative culturally conservative groups uh, in the United States. They still have a governing structure that, um, uh, that they've been practicing since uh, the coming of the Spanish. And Coach de Pueblo has built <clears throat> their own town. And they also have, as you can see here, one of the uh, highest ranked uh, golf courses in the country, public golf courses in the country. And Coach de Pueblo um, also has a tremendous uh, uh, employment rate as well. Next slide, please. Remember two First Nations in Nova Scotia. And you can see here that they have a tremendous uh, number of businesses that they've uh, put together. And they've done this through becoming uh, International Standards Organization certified, ISO certified. They're the first indigenous nation uh, that I know of that is ISO certified. There are 169 countries that are part of the ISO certification process. And it's, and it's, it's a highly standardized system, certification system. It's hard to get an ISO certification. And member two, through that certification, has basically restructured themselves in terms of their government. And as a result, they have just developed this uh, a, a huge number 
of corporate businesses. And investors are knocking on their door wanting to do business with Member 2, the Mi'kmaq Nation. Next slide, please. They've also, in, in the process of becoming successful, have uh, uh, garnered strategic alliances with universities and colleges, uh, as well as corporations from throughout the world. And as a result, when you go to, to Member 2, uh, they have beautiful homes, beautiful roads, and in the midst of that, they've had a cultural revolution as well. Next slide, please. Osuyus in uh, southern British Columbia. The same thing as well. The stories there are tremendous. They are one of the f first, uh, first nations that have, uh, thank you, that actually ha they, they have their own vineyard. Uh, often when we start talking about alcohol, the thought is, oh, alcohol abuse. There isn't a problem at Osuyus. Why? Because you can get bottles of wine, $100 a, a, a pop, $200 a pop. So who wants to get drunk on $200 a bottle of wine? And they've actually um, uh, partnered with uh, one of the top four wineries in the world. And so they sell their wine. And in the process of that, they put together Spirit uh, Ridge uh, Lodge. So, <clears throat> so if you want to get married, that's the place to get married because it's beautiful, you'll be treated well, and almost every non-indigenous person that lives in the area wants to get married at Spirit Ridge. Usually you have white flight from indigenous areas, but here everybody wants to go there, just like at Mississippi Choctaw. Today, there are 7,000 black and white workers going to Mississippi Choctaw to work. They have so many jobs that they have to import labor. It's unbelievable. And this is in the middle of Ku Klux Klan country. You all seen that movie, A Mississippi Burning? That's where it happened. So in the midst of a tremendous amount of racism, you have an indigenous nation that's building a nation that works. Next. Citizen Potawatomi Nation of Oklahoma, an unbelievable story. Their traditional territory is on the eastern part of the United States, and they've been pushed westward with the settlers coming to settle, and they've been pushed all through Michigan, all through Kansas, all the way to Oklahoma. And in the process, had lost their culture, but recently they've regained their culture. They regained their tradition. And in the midst of becoming successful, uh, this is where they started. They had $550 in the bank. And the, the council was fighting over how to spend the $550. And they, this is their tribal office, office here. Uh, the chief there, his name is Rocky Baird. He says, we had the three worst cars ever built before. Uh, have AMC Gremlin, uh, the GM Opal, and I can't, I can't see what the other one is. But now, their tribal headquarters, this is what it looks like. And they have over $500 million in the bank, and that bank that they had $550 in, they own that bank. <laughs> Next slide, please. They also have built uh, uh, this Fire Lake uh, discount uh, grocery store, and it, and it rivals Walmart. You go here, you get a cheaper grocery than Walmart, and it's hard to beat Walmart. And they did it through vertical, vertical integration process of, uh, of, uh, of, um, of their business. And here's the bank that they own now, and that's where they had the $550. And they don't only just own one, they own several banks as well. And they've restructured their constitution several times, and it's an unbelievable place. Next slide, please. The, I just want to just sort of just touch on this real, real quickly. Uh, push. Saginaw, Michigan. Uh, one of the most successful housing projects that, that you'll ever find. But I just wanted to note uh, here, they also run this Eagle Valley uh, Outfitters. It says 10,000 years of outdoor experience. <laughs> and you can get anything online related to outdoors. Uh, they've been very successful. They have a, a you see the housing project there as well. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, 
you have Tanaka in British Columbia. <clears throat> they turned their residential school where a lot of the elders have had just absolutely um, uh, terrible memories of, uh, uh, of their experience. And they've turned this residential school into a hotel. And when you go through the front door, you'll still see the cross uh, going into the, into the building. But they've turned something that was quite ugly uh, to the community, to the elders, into something that's just absolutely wonderful. And in the process, they manage their own forestry, they manage a host of other issues uh, and, and land areas. Uh, and the Tanaka, uh, all, uh, many of the Tanaka members also go down into, uh, across the border of the United States and, and into Montana as well. Next slide, please. Meadow Lake uh, Tribal Council and Prince Albert Council. Uh, can indigenous people run uh, uh, an airline? Yes. The Meadow Lake Tribal Council and Prince Albert uh, both own 50% of, uh, of, of this um, airline company in Canada. And recently they've been rated one of the top 50 businesses in, in Canada. Next slide, please. There it is. So. So these are nation-owned enterprises. Uh, what about uh, private business? The private, business, private businesses are also just uh, uh, exploding in indigenous country in the United States and also Canada. In particular, you had the Pine Ridge, um, South Dakota uh, Chamber of Commerce. Over 100 private businesses have been started in the area. At one point in time, Pine Ridge was rated the poorest place in the United States. They no longer have that distinction. They sort of move beyond that, and a lot has had to do with uh, private businesses. You'll see these Angie's Burritos. Angie uh, married a Mexican uh, gentleman. He taught her how to make burritos, and she sells burritos. Very successful business. And uh, uh, Carlene Hunter actually started the, the Tatanka Bar. A lot of your marathon runners, um, this, that's the bar that they want. You can even order this online. And it's made out of berries and buffalo meat. A high protein a bar used for, uh, by uh, many of the top athletes in the world. And uh, very, very successful uh, private entrepreneurship. Next slide, please. So what explains the success? You know, is it uh, federal money? Is it, um, you know, uh, picking the right leaders? Is it uh, luck? Uh, let me tell you what it is or what we think it is. All of, the, all of that stuff helps. But we think really the action, next. We think it has a lot to do with like the Cherokee Nation Judicial Building there. You see Isleta del Sur, which is a, a, an Indian nation that has been moved from their traditional homeland down into Texas, in El Paso, Texas, and they've survived there for 300 years and have become a major economic engine of the area. Um, you'll see also um, the Osage Nation governmental reform that just recently happened a couple years ago, and it just changed the political face of, of that nation. Uh, up in Alaska, you have a, a, an alternative dispute resolution mechanism that has reduced the recidivism rate of uh, juvenile offenders by almost 100%, 97.5 to be exact. Next. You'll see also that um, many of these nations have their own law enforcement agencies. Uh, my brother actually is a criminal investigator at Navajo Nation. Uh, he's the Navajo CSI. He investigates major crimes in, on the western side of Navajo Nation, uh, murder, rape, all major crimes. The reason why the Navajo Nation went that route is because by the time you call the FBI down in Phoenix and they arrive on the Navajo Nation, the evidence is gone. So Navajo Nation said, we're going to have our own CSI. We're going to have our own criminal investigators. And you can see on the far right there sort of the emblem that he wears um, uh, on his uniform. And he received his training in Quantico, Virginia, 
where the other FBI's also received their training. Next slide, please. Here's the Navajo Nation Supreme Court. You can see here we have two women on the court, and uh, the Chief Justice is a, is a man. Uh, up on top there, you have the Red Lake uh, Chippewa uh, 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 Walleye Recovery Program. Uh, the Red Lake um, uh, started a major initiative to recover walleye. At one point in time, the walleye population had almost gone down to zero. And um, they brought the walleye back. Unbelievable. Next. Here's Nishka in British Columbia. Here's their, their council chambers. I think that's the uh, minister from uh, British Columbia give, addressing the, uh, the council there. Uh, here's their um, motto, uh, one heart, one path, one nation. Next slide, please. So we think a, a big part of the answer is governance. You know, it's about how these nations govern themselves. Who makes the decisions? Who's in charge? And we think the action is around that. Not unlike uh, Eastern Europe, not unlike South Africa after apartheid fell apart, not unlike Eastern Europe after uh, the Iron Curtain fell apart, because those are examples of colonization. In the United States, colonization is slowly going by the wayside. Now, I'm not saying that it's uh, uh, completely gone, not by any means. There are still a lot of issues around colonization, but colonization has sort of taken the backside to uh, sovereignty, uh, political sovereignty, self-rule. Who calls the shots? In the United States, indigenous peoples are calling the shots. In Canada, slowly, by and large, indigenous nations are calling the shots. And in turn, wonderful things are happening. Unbelievable things are happening. The, as I said before, <clears throat> social pathologies are decreasing. Uh, and as a result, um, it, it's... Um, uh, tax of the people has gone down and it, it, it's a wonderful time to be indigenous because times are really, really good. I never thought that in my lifetime that such a thing would ever happen. I always thought that we would always be under the thumb of the federal government of the United States, but that is not the case. So we'll see after this new election where all of this goes. So what is nation building or nation rebuilding? Because we're rebuilding our nations. It's, um, it's not about necessarily about claiming rights. It's really much more than that. It has less to do with what rights you do have. It's about you. It has less to do with what other governments do. It's about what you do as a government. It really has no endpoints rights are lost or won and defended when challenged, but nation building really is about assertion of those rights. Thanks. And you really have to exercise it effectively. If you want to go somewhere, you have to have good governance, you have to have good governance, you have to have good governance. And we think that that's where the answer lies. And the best defense of sovereignty is to govern well. So nation building, here's the definition of nation building. You can see here, it's about who's in charge. It's about who's calling the shots. It's about who's taking over responsibility for their lives. And who knows best what the conditions are on various Indian nation lands, the indigenous people themselves. So who knows best what the answers are, the indigenous peoples themselves. And the federal government of the United States has taken on this role of being a technical advisor rather than continuing to have this guardian ward relationship. It's no more about that any longer. It's about being on equal footing and having indigenous peoples make the right choices, make the decisions. They'll make mistakes because that's what nation building is all about. Has the United States gotten nation building right? After Bernie Madoff? I don't think so. Have they gotten, has Australia got it right? I was just reading in the papers that there are some issues, there's some problems. Nope. 
So every nation has problems, but it's who's in charge, who's calling the shots that really makes the huge, huge difference. Next slide, please. So what are the common patterns? We think first and foremost, it has to be about jurisdiction, self-rule, or sovereignty. You have to have that attitude. <clears throat> These indigenous nations that I'm talking about have that jurisdictional attitude. You, you'll see here the various powers and authority that, that, that's enjoyed by uh, indigenous nations in the United States. We do all of this. The only thing that we don't do is what's down at the bottom. Postal service, uh, issue our own currency, as well as have a standing army. We used to, <laughs> but we no longer have a standing army. But we enjoy all of this. We have criminal courts, civil courts. We have business permitting, business regulation. And in the United States, we're the ones that are in charge of our lands, our country. We know best how to take care of it. Next. And it's really interesting. It's about freedom. It's about freedom, freedom to make a choice. That's what democracy is supposed to be all about, is the freedom to make a choice. In the United States, there's a bit more freedom. There's a bit more freedom to do that. You'll see here Salish Kootenai. Salish Kootenai in Montana, one of the first Indian nations to take over almost every aspect of their land operation. It's, a, it's an unbelievable place. They're one of the first nations to be truly self-governing. And wonderful things have happened. They take care of the land better than anybody else. Next. So it's this jurisdictional sovereignty attitude. But you can have all the jurisdiction in the world, you can have all the sovereignty in the world and still fall flat on your face. You have to have the second ingredient. You have to have capable governing institutions. Why is it so important? Because governments establish and enforce the rules by which we play. And if the rules aren't right, then there's a problem. But these rules also have to be culturally appropriate as well. Two tests for capable governing institution. Test one, you have to have leadership and management that's, that's just absolutely effective, that works, and that's competent. Here are some examples. There's Ho-Chunk, Inc., uh, the Winnebago tribe of, um, of uh, Nebraska. Uh, they came, they, they cut their unemployment rate almost in half. Once they took over the projects, they have a, uh, a a Harvard-trained tribal citizen CEO that runs all these businesses. Every morning when I get up, uh, I read the New York Times, I read USA Today, I, read, I check uh, National Public Radio, and then I go to Indians.com, Indians.com with a Z, and I catch up with my, all my indigenous news. And Indians.com is run by Ho-Chunk, Inc. So if you go online tomorrow morning, or even this afternoon, or this evening, Check Indians.com. But along with that, back it up, please. Along with that, you also have at the bottom the Sandia uh, water quality. Uh, Sandia <coughs> initiated their water quality standards that was higher than the city of Albuquerque in New Mexico. Albuquerque didn't like it, took it to court. Sandia won. But why did they want pristine waters? Because the water that flows through Sandia Pueblo is sacred. It's sacred water. All the ceremonies are attached to that water. So the water has to be pure and clean. And Albuquerque didn't have those water quality standards, but Sandia had higher water quality standards and it held up in court. Next. So the political challenge really is, how do you make investors feel safe? I spent quite a bit of time in South Africa, um, and my question is, um, do you want to invest in South Africa? Maybe, maybe not. Not after I've seen all these uh, uh, windows boarded up, uh, razor sharp fencing around many of these buildings. You know, do they have a law enforcement issue? Yes. Do you want to invest in Mexico, where you have to pay off the drug cartels? 
Probably not. You want to invest in Russia? Uh, well, there's mafia issues. See, you have to make investors safe. You have to, they have to feel secure. They have to feel as though that their investment is going to be safe there. And that's what indigenous nations in the United States and Canada have done, is actually set up an environment safe for investment. Next. Test one, test two, preventing political piracy. Um, when Ferdinand Marcos was in charge of uh, the Philippines, we all heard stories about his wife, right? Who had how many thousands of shoes, you know, among other things. And, you know, how do you prevent somebody putting their hands in the cookie jar? In particular, the leaders. You separate business from politics. So indigenous nations have separated business from politics where indigenous, the leaders themselves cannot get their hands in the cookie jar. And how do you do that? You have a strong third party enforcer uh, in, um, in the court systems. And remember this, the citizen part of Wadami Nation. Next. <clears throat> and they went to this. But also, um, how do they do that? Next. They set up a new constitution that highlights all these issues here, constitutions, judicial review, and uh, the chief, uh, Rocky Barrett, says, how do I know that we have an independent judicial system? He says, I've taken two cases to our court each time I lost. He says, that's how I know it's independent and it's strong and it's fair. Next. You see the San Carlos Apache elders. They're essentially the fourth branch of the government of uh, San Carlos Apaches. At one point in time, the legislative branch was fighting against the executive branch. The judicial branch was fighting against everybody else. They all removed each other, and it was a chaos. So the San Carlos Apache elders stepped in, and they, they're the finger waggers. They said, you cannot do that. If you're going to be an Apache leader, this is the way an Apache leader acts. This is the way a leader should behave. This is the way our government should run. So they became the finger waggers and it initiated an ancient form of political structure. Elders, the place of elders, role and responsibilities of elders, and in modern time, the elders have become a part of government. And the San Carlos Apaches have done that. The Northwest tribe of, uh, has their own appeals court. So in Northwest, many of these tribes have uh, banded together to form their appeals, uh, appeals court system. So if, you, if a case is litigated here and the individuals uh, in the nations, a case can be uh, heard in the next level in the appellate court. Next. Oh, up on top is the Navajo Nation uh, common law, fundamental law that I talked about at the very beginning. Um, and uh, Navajo Nation uh, actually practices that in their, um, in their dealings. Down at the bottom here, I, I talked about the politically independent uh, dispute resolution mechanism, absolutely crucial. We think that that's the make or break, break characteristic of development. You have to have that. You have to have that. Next. So two tests, now three tests. Capable requires legitimacy. Legitimacy in the eyes of the, of the people themselves. At Navajo, next slide, at Navajo, what's legitimate? It's Navajo fundamental laws. How Navajo people see the world. We have our own laws, all the way from the beginning of creation. And through these creation stories, certain things have happened that make us Navajo. We're a matrilineal, matriarchal, matri uh, matrilocal society. So our, law, our laws are tied to this matrilineal, matriarchal, matrilocal system. And that's, those are our laws. It's very different than the non-Navajo laws, in particular, the white laws. Very, very different. Very patrilineal, patriarchal, and patrilocal. So how do you continue your culture? You initiate your own laws, and you practice those laws uh, through courts. And here's an example of legitimacy. In the old days, if you were a leader, everyone knew 
what their role was, and the clan leaders consulted the elders and told you when you stepped out of line. If you don't have that, you're gonna have trouble. Next. Cultural match, absolutely crucial. A lot of indigenous nations in the United States are building governing systems that, that define who they are. Cultural legitimacy is about, that's my government, that's Cochiti government, that's me. That's Navajo government, that's me. That's Apache government, that's me. That's Tanaka government, that's me. So that's legitimate. Where you have legitimacy, people buy into it. They say, I wanna support that. That's my government, it's a reflection of who I am. But if it's an outside imposed governing structure, it's hard to find that as legitimate and to support it. And as a result, you have chaos, you have factionalism, you have problems and issues. Next. Here's a, here's a, a mismatch. In the 1930s, the United States government said to indigenous nations, have I got a government for you? Here's the government. It's a one size fits all, one model fits all. And they said, we'll have centralized power, directly elected executive, representative council, no independent judicial function, and you had politicized business management. The same thing happened in Canada. And we kind of wonder, why is everybody fighting each other? Why do we fight against this family and this other family? Why? Because we had a culturally illegitimate political structure. Now, in an indigenous country in the United States, also in Canada, new governments are being invented. New governments are being created. Unlike any time in the history of North America. Next. You can see here up on top, non-indigenous, imposed, and ineffective. At the bottom, indigenous, chosen, and effective. And this is what we're seeing. So where there's indigenous choice, we find that economic development increases, social pathologies are dipping, there seems to be a healthier community. Next. Here's one of our, our leaders, and he says, a nation's laws are the deepest expression of its culture. They say what we value and how we intend to get along and hold ourselves together as a people. So if we don't have our own laws, if it's imposed from the outside, and if it's not legitimate, it's gonna be hard to hold a people together. But in indigenous country in North America, this is the phenomenon that we're seeing. This is the renaissance that we're seeing in modern times. It's an unbelievable time. I wake up in the morning and I think to myself, my gosh, I'm sure glad I'm indigenous. It's wonderful. It's a wonderful time to be alive. Next. There's also the opportunity when you're in charge to plan long term. We see that, that when you're in charge, you can plan for the future. You can plan for those that are yet unborn. You can plan for your grandchildren. You can devise governing systems. You can think about developing a healthy community the way you want to build your nation. And you can answer questions like, how do I want my kids to dress 100 years from now? How do I want them to pray? What kind of education do I want them to have? What kind of homes do I want them to live in? How do I want them to worship? What kind of language do I want them to be speaking? So forth and so on. All the important questions that we must answer. I have three grandkids. I've been blessed with three grandkids. When I first uh, saw my first grandchild, unbelievable. It's so different than when you have your own kids. When you see your own grandchild, your first grandchild, it changes the way you think about the future. All of a sudden you're putting more money away for your grandchild. All of a sudden you see yourself years and years to come. It's very, very different. But when somebody else is deciding for you how your grandkids are gonna live and those that are yet unborn, it, a future doesn't seem as bright. So for indigenous nations in North America, once we started taking over, we knew that we had to plan for the future. We could finally do it without somebody else saying to us, do it this way, do it that way. Next. 
And then you have to have good leadership. Next slide, please. Just like these elders, the uh, San Carlos Apache elders, the finger waggers, good leadership. Next. So what's good government? You know, the one, a good government is one that will take care of the challenges that you're facing. A good government is one that will see the future with you. Next slide, please. And we think that you have to pass two tests. It has to be culturally appropriate. Cultural legitimacy has to be there. It has to work. It has to be effective. Do the people believe the government they have is really theirs? Too often, colonizers sort of impose their own governing structure on us. Is it effective? Does the governance system have what it takes to get the job done? Does it really work? Next, please. So rules, we believe, are absolutely critical. Law. Here, the Aborigines of Australia, they talk about law. Law is absolutely important, critical. And we think that the rules, the law, is more important than all the resources in the world. You can have all the resources in the world and fall flat on your face. But you have to have good rules, good rules, absolutely good rules. All the rest of the stuff helps, but if you have good institutions, things will work out much better. It actually, good institutions actually outlast leaders. Sometimes we see uh, communities where people are saying, we just need that one leader. They're looking for the savior, you know? They're looking for one person to save them. But it takes 25 years to grow a good leader, and you cannot always trust that leader also. You never know, but you can always trust the rules. That's why these creation stories and the laws that come up through our creation stories are so critical to who we are as a people. And for us, we've incorporated it into our governing system. And all of a sudden, the communities are very, very different. People look at each other very, very diff different. They're working together in unison to take on the challenges that we face. Next. Here's Rocky Barrett. He says, a tribal government without good rules is just a bad family reunion. <laughs> Ain't that the truth? So what are the keys? Here's, here's, here are the keys that are spelled out. Go ahead. And really, it's about all the things that I just mentioned to you about political sovereignty, capable institutions of governance, uh, cultural match, strategic thinking long term, having good leaders. Those seem to be the keys to development. Next. So is nation building revolution just about business? Uh, we don't think so. Next. It's about culture. It's about the Cherokee language revitalization program. At one point in time, the Cherokee language was just about dead. And the Cherokees have turned it around. In two years, the first graduating class from the high school in Cherokee, the kids there will be fluent Cherokee speakers. Fluent. And it started in Head Start, four or five year olds. They immersed the kids in the Cherokee language. It's about culture. Next. It's about health. It's about reducing the social pathologies. Jemez Pueblo has an award-winning healthcare facility. Down here at the bottom, uh, Coeur d'Alene um, uh, put together a joint agreement with uh, their neighbor, a non-Indian uh, community, and built a healthcare facility that, that rivals any healthcare facility in the United States. Uh, you see the Citizen Potawatomi dentists. You see that um, a lot of uh, Indian nations are building just wonderful health facilities as well. Next. It's about taking care of the land. I talked about um, the Sage and Kootenai, the flatheads of Montana. Um, basically, they run the, they take care of their, their entire land themselves. They have their own conservation officers. They have their own law enforcement officers. They have their own biologists. And many of them are their own people. 
and they handle and take care of all the wildlife and water and so forth on the lands. Next. It's about restoring natural resources. I talked about this er earlier with Red Lake uh, in, um, in Minnesota, Red Lake Chippewa. Uh, the walleye just about died and they brought back the walleye from the brink of extinction. And today, young kids can actually go fishing and actually be Anishinaabe, Chippewa. Be culturally Anishinaabe because without walleye, you're not Anishinaabe. You have to have walleye. It's like family. And so if the walleye had died, they would have died too, culturally. But they brought back the fish and now they're more Anishinaabe than they have ever been. Next. It's about education. Up on top, we have the Akwesasne Freedom School. It's, a, it's run entirely by um, the parents. They don't accept any money from any federal government or state agency. They run the school themselves. And their emphasis is on culture and language. Next. It's about honoring the best of the nation. It's about our elders. It's about the kids. It's about our veterans. Uh, in the United States, <clears throat> the Indian people have uh, served in the armed forces uh, in greater numbers than any ethnic minority group in the United States. Why? Because the thought is we're defending our land. We're defending our homeland. And they fought in every war. Uh, in World War I, American Indians were not citizens of the United States. Even then, there were a huge number of enlistees uh, from Indian nations and fought in World War I. In World War II, many of them did not have also citizen st citizenship status in, in a very, some, because some of the various states would not allow citizenship to occur. And they still fought in World War II. Unbelievable. Next. And that's and they honor the citizen of Potawatomi. We have this wall of honor where every single veteran that served in, in every war is honored. So you go to a kiosk and you can actually bring up the story of, of that particular veteran that has fought in war or served in, in service. It's about honoring uh, the very best of the nation. It's about <clears throat> Ceremony, culture, economic development. It's about housing. It's about sovereignty. Uh, it's about the future. And we think the future looks very bright. We think the future in our own hands is very, very bright. Next. It's about the grandchildren. It's about those that are yet unborn. And <clears throat> ever since indigenous people of the United States and Canada began to run the show, make decisions for our own lives, have things turned around. And uh, we think <clears throat> that it's not unlike what's happening in Iraq, in Afghanistan, in Eastern Europe, South Africa, where you have colonization that gets rooted in, um, if the colonizers don't face up to the fact that conditions are not going to improve until freedom is given to the indigenous people, if they don't think along those lines, you're going to continue to have poverty. You're going to continue to have social pathologies. You're going to continue to pay for all of that. And how a settler or colonist <coughs> colonizing country gets defined is, the, is by how it treats it, its indigenous people. That's the definition that that country takes on. And we think conditions are getting better and better in the United States and also Canada. And we wish that this would be the same way for our brothers and sisters here in Australia, in New Zealand, and elsewhere throughout the world. So that's the story I bring to you. And the story is a good one. And I think there are lessons to be learned about that. 
we thought, and a lot of people thought, that indigenous peoples were going to die off. At the turn of the century, we numbered, Navajo Nation numbered 7,000. Now we number 300,000. We're not going anywhere. In fact, we're thriving, and we're going to thrive even more. And we're going to take our rightful place in the history of the world. As indigenous people, we're responsible to the earth, to the plants, to the animals, to the water, to the minerals. We're responsible for that. We're responsible for the air. We're responsible for the mountains. We're responsible for the stars and all the way up into the heavens. And now, there's a lot of talk about climate change. As human beings, we're very fragile. If our temperature is at 98.6, we're okay. If it dips down a little bit, we're in trouble. If it goes up a little bit higher, we're in trouble. And I believe that indigenous people have, <clears throat> have answers to some of these challenges that we face. And only when we are engaged will those answers come forth. And that's my hope and prayer, my brothers and sisters, that that will happen here in Australia and elsewhere. Thank you very much. Well, that was absolutely stunning. And Dr. Bagay, your vision of the political, social, moral, legal transformation of the Navajo Nation is really quite inspiring. And uh, when we set up these lectures, we were hoping uh, that they would involve the sharing of dialogue from around the world relevant to the indigenous experience here and I think you would all agree that uh, tonight that's been a most outstanding example of our hope for these orations. So would you please thank Dr. Begay. <laughs> and uh, if you'd like to step forward we have a, a gift for you. And we also have, have one for Auntie Diane Kerr as well. So if you'd like to come to us. Tonight we also have an announcement uh, of a quite different nature and it's my pleasure to be able to introduce it. Uh, Marap Barak, our Institute of Indigenous Development is a year old uh, this month and we're marking this occasion with the announcement of its foundation corporate partnership with Rio Tinto Australia. Rio Tinto is an organisation with which the university's had a long-standing relationship, developed over time, working across a number of projects and faculty areas. And this partnership is now entering a new stage of opportunity through its linkage with Marap Barak. <clears throat> the partnership between Rio Tinto and Marap Barak, in common with the best of our university partnerships with external organisations, has evolved slowly and thoughtfully based on a great deal of discussion and has created a careful understanding between the two organisations. So it's my pleasure uh, to introduce the Managing Director of Rio Tinto Australia, who will speak of and formally launch Marap Barak's Foundation Corporate Partnership, um, Mr David Peaver. <coughs> Thank you, Warren. The Honourable Alex Chernov, Chancellor of this University, Auntie Diane Kerr, Dr Manley Begay, Professor Warren Bebbington, Professor Marcia Langton, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. 
Thank you, Professor Bebbington, for that warm introduction. I too would like to thank Dr. Begay for what was an inspiring, instructive, and informative story. So thank you very much. Could I also, as is custom customary, respectfully acknowledge the traditional owners and the custodians of the land in which we meet today, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. Also, to remember that this day in 1918, on this day in 1918, arms were laid down on the Western Front. This evening, ladies and gentlemen, I'm proud to launch Rio Tinto's partnership with the Marup, Marup Barak Institute for Indigenous Development. The partnership initiatives will encourage leadership, innovation and scholarship to improve the lives of Indigenous Australians. Before I explain, though, why we have developed this partnership, let me give you a thumbnail sketch of Rio Tinto. To some of you, we are probably just another name in the business pages. The Rio Tinto Group is a world leader in finding and mining minerals and metals. We produce aluminium, mine copper, diamonds, coal, iron ore, uranium, gold and industrial minerals in more than 50 countries around the world. The group's origins go way back uh, by Western standards to 1873 when the Rio Tinto Company revived historic Spanish mines that have an incredibly long history way back to the Bronze Age, in fact. The Zinc Corporation, a Melbourne-based company, was set up to then apply innovative technology to recover zinc from Broken Hill tailings in 1905. In Aboriginal terms, though, our history is very brief. Australian companies over a century old, however, are uncommon. And ours is an industry where you can indeed find people who are third generation miners. In short, we care about our history and we try to learn from it. Legal recognition of traditional land tenure was a major milestone in Australian social and legal history. It was a cause for rejoicing for Indigenous Australians and their supporters. The reaction of our industry was, though, to put it mildly, mixed. To some, traditional land tenure seemed a direct threat to land access for mineral exploration. Despite their growing technological sophistication, mineral exploration and mining are high-risk endeavours. Any development that promises to add to that risk is deplored. So when the chief executive of Rio Tinto's predecessor, CRA, Mr Leon Davis, announced that the company fully accepted the central tenets of traditional ownership, I, I, we have written here some, but I'd say many saw these words as corporate spin. Um, and those who know Rio Tinto know we're actually not prone to corporate spin and others saw it as an abandonment of principles underpinning Australia's property laws. Within the company, though, the announcement was a relief. For too long, our industry's strictly legalistic approach to land rights had soured relationships between mineral explorers and Indigenous Australians. Moreover, in this company, we were starting to realise that there was a conflict, conflict between what we did on Australia and what we did overseas. And we saw that in other developed countries, some form of traditional tenure survived. In Australia, our relationships with Indigenous communities, communities were strictly regulated by state and federal authorities. In North America and elsewhere, on the other hand, we tried to understand and mitigate the economic, social and environmental impacts of our operations on local and regional communities. You could not visit a resource development in outback Australia without being acutely aware of the economic and social differences between the employees and the long-term residents. Piecemeal attempts to assist local communities were made prior to Mabo. Local people were employed in fairly basic tasks. Some funds were directed to health clinics and education. Quite often, the well-meaning initiatives failed to fulfil the hopes of those 
who put a lot of thought and resources into their development. With hindsight, we now understand that programs of this nature require both parties to feel empowered. Otherwise, there can never be the interchange of ideas and mutual respect essential to success in such endeavours. There were other drivers for the new approach. One was generational change. Resource companies compete for talented young recruits. Such people tend to want to work for companies whose reputation for, so, for, for financial success is matched by a reputation for taking social and environmental issues seriously. For Rio Tinto, gaining the respect of Indigenous Australians is a challenge, yet over the past 25 years, some progress has been made, but we acknowledge there is a lot more to be done. First, Rio Tinto's engagement with local communities is no longer a peripheral issue to be handled in an ad hoc manner by local managers. It's a core concern discussed regularly at board level and is understood that poor performance in this area can and will have repercussions for the performance of our business across the group. Consistent with this understanding, Rio Tinto now employs senior professionals with social science skills at sites and headquarters. Their efforts are supplemented by a growing, by a growing network of Indigenous and non-Indigenous experts and advisors. Fundamentally, their aim is to help us see the world from a different angle, to break through the cultural and social barriers that limit understanding and empathy. Secondly, we now try to deal with fundamental causes rather than symptoms. Let me give you an example. A generation ago, relatively few Aboriginal males were employed in equipment operations or mechanic shops. Frequently, employment meant casual labour, typically used for work such as collecting seed for regeneration plots, an important task, but not one to provide a stable income for the community. We developed training programs that catered for cultural differences. However, it was obvious that ill health, poor education, poverty and social and cultural disruption fed off one another. Intervention in one area alone was never going to break the, a cycle that started before a child was born and ended in third world mortality rates. What was needed was a more comprehensive, long-term regional approach to economic and social empowerment. No mining company wants to be an enclave of prosperity in a sea of poverty, yet not even a group with the resources of Rio Tinto can undertake such a task, such, sorry, such a legacy of dispossession. And the third reason for saying that some progress has already been made is that we now realise therefore, that we cannot bring about change alone. Nevertheless, Rio Tinto does have resources and skills that can contribute to the empowerment of Indigenous Australians. In some cases, it is uniquely positioned to do so, but only when combined with the efforts of Indigenous institutions, governments at all levels, private enterprise and bodies such as this university. Frankly, I personally don't want to be part of a society where a minority are condemned to economic disadvantage, nor do I want my neighbours to feel that the resources of this land are profiting people who have never seen the land, while they whose ancestors cared for the land merely subsist and cannot break out of dependency and poverty traps. The fourth reason for remaining hopeful is leaders and leadership. There have always been outstanding Indigenous leaders. William Barak is an obvious example, whose personal stature impressed settlers and visitors. That was not an easy task when those settlers were, by and large, convinced of their cultural, spiritual and racial superiority. Today, that sense of superiority is less obvious. We are more inclined to judge people on their merits and to respect their culture and diversity by their ability, ability to master technology and to create and to contribute. That's why I feel positive. 
One of the achievements that we in Rio Tinto are most proud of is that we employ 1,600 Indigenous men and women, a growing number in skilled and professional roles. We are seeing more Aboriginal businesses servicing our industry. In Western Australia alone, over the last two years, Rio Tinto has awarded $250 million in contracts for Aboriginal companies. When an Indigenous Australian manages one of our major operations, it will be one milestone showing the vicious cycle is at least dented, if not broken. The antenatal clinics, the education programs and scholarships, the employment initiatives, the cross-cultural training and the economic stimulus programs will have borne some fruit. When that day comes, this university will be able to share some of the credit for having nurtured the leaders responsible for that rising level of Indigenous economic participation and social empowerment. And we in Rio Tinto will be gratified to have been the foundation corporate partner of the Marup Barak Institute. Thank you very much. Chancellor, Ani Diane Kerr, Dr. Begay, ladies and gentlemen. Ani Diane, thank you for your welcome to country. And I'd like to, as the protocol demands, pay the respects of my people, Palawa Trawana, Paima Marana, Trawalawe, and Plumber Marilla clan groups. My task is to make some concluding and brief remarks. The benediction, if you like. When I thought about this, what is an appropriate benediction to make in an occasion like this, I was drawn to a salutation written some years ago by the Aboriginal poet, Idru Nunaku, or Kath Walker. This salutation is <coughs> the final verse in her poem, Song of Hope. The poem is nearly 40 years old. It's from another era, an era before Aboriginal people could expect the rights of citizenship. It is a call to political struggle in a time of tremendous uh, disadvantage. But also, it's a moving vision for a new age. And I'll read this poem in its entirety. Look up, my people. The dawn is breaking. The world is waking to a new bright day. When none defame us, nor colour shame us, nor sneer dismay. Now brood no more on the years behind you. The hope assigned you shall the past replace. When just a justice, grown wise and stronger, points the bone no longer at a darker race. So long we waited, bound and frustrated, till hate be hated, and cast deposed. Now light shall guide us, and all doors open that long were closed. See plain the promise, dark freedom lover, night's nearly over. And though long the climb, new rights will greet us, new mateship meet us, and joy complete us in our new dream time. To our fathers' fathers, the pain, the sorrow. To our children's children, the glad tomorrow. Dr. Bagay, you've shown us that that glad tomorrow is within our grasp. And for that, I thank you. Can I, on behalf of the university, extend our great thanks to Rio Tinto Australia and University Piva for joining this partnership, and importantly for the driver that brought you to uh, commit yourself to that partnership. I have no doubt that this will be a very successful partnership, uh, and like all successful partnerships, it will be to the mutual benefit of both. And I don't mean monetary benefit, I mean much broader than that. I'd also like to join others in thanking Dr Bigay. You have really shown 
what one can do if one has the opportunity to take up and does take up responsibility for your own future. And I think importantly you've shown how the rule of law is essential to any uh, community development. So we've learned a lot today and I don't think I've heard one note of complaint, one note of antagonism from anything you've said today. And that was very, very enlightening and I take a lot away from what you've said. Now, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes the proceedings of the NAM oration for 2010. Um, I would ask you to uh, indulge in a little bit of uh, discomfort by standing when the uh, procession departs the auditorium. Thank you.